Hey everyone, welcome to another Magic the Gathering video. So I've been sort of threatening a return to looking at decks, uh, but I didn't want to necessarily exactly keep to the format that I used for the uh, Deck Dirtle series. Uh, what I've done now, if, if you'll notice, is I've sort of taken the Scryfall component and that's very much become its own thing. So what I wanted to do is a series where I'm a bit more talking about the deck itself, but I will still be leveraging for certain cards that I think are, are critical to the deck, mainly like the, you know, the win condition of the deck, if you like, and certain clever mechanics in the deck. Um, for those cards, I will be going down sort of mini rabbit holes just for the point of discussion on both um oh dear me <laughs> sorry on both on scryfall and uh cube cobra you'll, you'll see the format in a moment now the other thing i will say about this series is and uh, i know some people might not like this but i am going to focus on older decks i have this absolute fashion fa fashion sorry absolute fascination bordering on obsession of cards sort of up to around about 98 I don't know what it is but that period from you know the very first thing alpha beta unlimited up to um was it so mirage into tempest so before we get to as a saga and things get super crazy and super powerful so I don't know what it is, but there's something in those sort of early days when they were still sort of feeling out magic, if you like. And we had some of the really early blocks, but it was not quite there yet. And there was a few sort of bumps along the way as we went, you know, went from Urza Saga being super powerful to, was it Macadian Mask, where it was doled back completely. And it's just, I just like that period in the build up before we get into uh, the saga. Plus there's loads of real gems in there. So the series I'm going to call, if I haven't mentioned it already, I'm going to call it something like This Old Deck. And it's going to revolve around two books. This book, which is Deck Deconstruction, and I'll include links to the MTG Wiki article, because I think if you want to track down any old school Magic the Gathering Deck Construction book, this is the one I would go for because it's uh, um, they're revisiting articles from the duelist um, up to 98. So yeah, it, it sort of includes um, quite major parts of Tempest block. Basically, actually all of it, I think. So yeah, very interesting book. And these are the chapters and it goes through the different deck archetypes of that time. So permission, millstone, library depletion, weenie necro, stasis, sly, pro bloom, reanimator, multicolor, senior stompy, another mono green, uh, misocraft, goblin craft, another trick decks, trade wind decks, sliving death, another sliver decks, suicide black, oath of druids, nightmare survival, and then there's an index. One of several books from that period authored by Beth Morsand, who also um, had a hand, I think, in the... Yeah, I've got another book as well. Does she have a hand in the encyclopedias? Anyway, there's a few books I own where she is the author or co-author on that. And the other one which came out, I think, a little bit before it. I think this predates it, which is something called the Official Deck Builder's Guide. Slightly different format. The article on MTG Wiki doesn't have the breakdown of this. Um, I do really like this, but it wouldn't necessarily be to everybody's um, preference. Uh, let me just quickly have a look. The, I mean, the deck descriptions are OK. Um, and it's got some really cool decks in here. It goes up to Tempest. So yeah, the, but just the first set of the block. Uh, and it's got some Tempest decks that were specifically uh, put together by 
Watsi at the time and the author of this, which is, was it Tim Dedopolis, I think that is, um, we didn't actually see. So the last chapter, if you want to call it that, on Tempest features a number of decks and the descriptions in there, I believe, were written by Watsi. Um, so it's a, just, a, just a brief overview. So it's got the deck listing and then the type of deck it is and um, a sort of description of the deck and to some degree how to play it. It's, that's not always the same in all of the sections. And it goes through different um, types at the time. So sort of type one, was it type 1.5? There's a, a section on fifth edition common, which, you know, we now think of as being pauper decks but very specific to a set there's portal type 2 mirage ice age classic type 2 themes based around art, um, artists themes based around creatures themes based around stunts which would be i suppose called combos now and a multiplayer section um, a lot of the decks in there's a mixture of decks as well in this which is a mixture of tournament decks and casual decks this one is interesting because the decks generally come from different levels of tournament play and articles from something called um, the Dojo. And I'll include a link actually there. There is a, an archived version of the Dojo from about 97 to 98, somewhere around that period, which I'll try and remember to include a link in the description. So yeah, so... The series is going to base, be based around decks from these two books. And today we're going to be looking at an empty hand lock deck from, yeah, it'd be around the time of um, Tempest Block. We'll go through the cards individually like I've always done before. So we'll get them up and really uh, blown up on the screen so you can appreciate the artwork at the time. So... Notice, first thing, there's no creatures in this deck. So we've got 19 artifacts, four Cursed Scroll, four Ensnaring Bridge, four Lotus Petal, four Null Brooch, three Scroll Racks, seven Instants, four Dark Rituals, three Disenchants. There's no sideboard, by the way, in this deck. This was one from a, a Dojo article on um, lock decks, empty hand lock decks. Unfortunately, I couldn't find the article online. Um, yeah. Then... Uh, sorceries, four of those, wrath, all Wrath of Gods, 13 enchantments, three bottomless pits, three hidden retreats, four Magrim, Magrims, three Peace of Minds, and then the land base, which is, you know, for 60 card deck, 70, it's only 17 land. We've got four Reflecting Pools, four Salt Flats, interestingly, three Urza's Mine, three Urza's Power Plant, three Urza's Tower. Notice in this there are no basic lands okay so let us look at the deck in some detail and then you can see a bit of a giveaway here i'm going to learn, look at certain key cards which I, I see you know i consider to be they're not all the cards that are key to the deck but they're you know have that um that land aspect and slowly sort of slow damage and I'll try and describe here as we're going through as well the base, you know, what the cards do in the deck, what the idea behind all of this. I've got a, a description off to the side. Um, maybe maybe a quick overview before we do this. So, so in terms of the rough gameplay, I've, I've tried to work out with this. So early game, you're focusing on setting up your mana base, Dark Rituals, Lotus Petal, Urza's Lands. And of course, if you get the lands online, then... Yeah, you're going to have loads of mana to fuel your artifacts. And if you play Mergrim, Mergrim and Bottomless Pit fairly early on, that starts the discard engine, and we'll we'll look at that in a moment. In mid-game, you might be doing things like, you know, wrathing creatures, current controlling the board through in Staring Bridge, using Scroll right, Rack to find some key pieces, and then Null Brooch to counter stuff. And then late game, you're still, still maintaining control, with the various discard in here through the artifacts and other things and you know that whole thing with the um with the with the curse scroll and the magrim 
um, whittling down your opponent's life total. So you light, you, you know, your opponent is on a clock through the discard engine and the cards that damage through discard and then other cards which um, damage through, yeah. Um, well, you don't discard, but they, they damage by another means. Anyway, you'll, you'll see in a moment once we go through this. But I just thought it'd be good to lay out the overall, you know, gameplay of this. So the Cursed Scroll in here. So this is an artifact that can deal damage to creatures or players. So how does it do that? Well, it's one to cast. Three, tap it. You name a card and the target opponent chooses a card at random from your hand. If she, if he or she chooses the name card, Curse Scroll deals two damage to target, creature or player. So the idea with this is you want to make it so the probability of them choosing the card that's in your hand um, matches what you've named it. So like 100%. And how you do that is obviously just having one card in your hand. So there's other cards in here that help you, you know, discard your hand to get in a position where you've... So with this deck, you'll notice that there tends to be a tendency for you to want to be able to have either no hands, uh, no cards in your hand or um, one or very few. We've got four ensnaring bridges, so each creature with power greater than the number of cards in your hand cannot attack. So again, if you can get that down as low as possible, then it's power greater than the number of cards in your hand cannot attack. So again, it's advantageous to have as few cards in your hand as possible. So that's your board control. So it prevents creatures with power greater than the number of cards in your hand for attacking which is very effective if you have few cards in hand. We've got four Lotus Petals, which is a Mana Accelerant. So zero to cast. Tap Sack it, add one mana of any colour to your mana pool. Play this ability as a mana source. As we go through this, you'll notice in a moment what colours of mana we need to be playing even though the vast majority of this deck, or, or well, I'd say the vast majority, a large part of it is artifact, so it's manner of any colour. We've got four null brooches in here, four to cast, so the highest casting cost in here. Two, tap, discard your hand. Counter non-target, sorry, counter target non-creature spell. Play this ability as an interrupt. So this is really interesting because if you have no cards in your hand, um, you discard nothing, but the, this still goes ahead. You pay the cost, you tap it. Whatever you've got in your hand, you discard, including nothing. So it will still work if you have nothing in your hand and then you get to counter a target non-creature spell. So again, you want either as few cards in your hand so you're not discarding your hand or nothing yeah basically so again the, the trick with this deck is getting yourself in a position where you know you know either you want no cards in your hand or you want sufficient for other abilities to be able to work and you can sort of play the two off the other in in terms of the order in which you play or sort of activate so you should activate different cards then we've got three scroll racks in here so yeah and of course you, as you probably realized um, if you've got no cards in your hand you know the cost here is just two so two for a counter spell countering non-creature spells yeah so again protecting your board state so scroll rack yeah so with this two to cast one tap choose any number of cards in your hand and set those cards aside so you get to choose how many cards you set aside put an equal number of cards from the top of your library into your hand then put the cards set aside in this way on top of your library in any order so you've got this really interesting filtering effect but remember the amount of stuff you can filter is dependent on 
the number of cards. So again, it's sort of playing off between, okay, what's my optimum number of cards in my hand for any point in the game based on, am I using scroll wrap? Do I want to use null brooch? Do I want to use curse scroll? Yeah, so that's what you'd need to think about. But that's your card filtering. So, you know, you're using it to get to a point where you've got, you know, certain key cards that you have access to. And once that's happened, then, you know, your need to use the scroll rack will dissipate. And we've got our enchantment. So we've got bottomless pit here. So this is where our, you can see our colored mana comes in. So we need two black from one somewhere. So one and two black. During each player's upkeep, that player discards a card at random. And so this is everybody. So you're discarding cards during upkeep. Um, your opponents are. So again, you know, you have to think a lot about how many cards do I want in my hand in order for things to work because I'm. this is also causing me to discard my hand. I mean, it's helping because I, I want to have as few cards as possible. So, yeah, this is your... Um, your discard, yeah, your discard engine. Hidden Retreat, two and a white. Choose a card in your hand and put it on top of your library. Prevent all damage from an instant or sorcery. So basically, a, you know, a way of dealing with instant or sorceries. And you're taking a card from your hand and putting it on top of your library. So it, it's interesting because it's not you're not discarding to your um not you did not you're not discarding to your graveyard. And again, you know timing is everything in this deck and, and in what point in the game you need to have the various effects come online. Then we get a key card here, McGrim. So two and a black. It's working in cahoots with the bottomless pit. Whenever any opponent discards a card, McGrim deals two damage to him or her. So any of these cards in here which cause your um, opponent to discard, which is mainly, I think, this card, all the other ones, um, yeah, is, is specifically on you for various things. Um, yeah, you get... So, so with... The bottomless pit and the McGrim in play, they're getting pinged each time for two damage. So that's ticking away in the background. So I suppose you could say the idea is you want your opponent's life total to be whittled away, but you need to stay in the game long enough for that to happen. So all the other cards in here are supporting that in various ways of you staying in the game. And we have peace of mind, which can help out with that. So one and a white, white, choose and discard a card. So again, in this deck, there are advantages in having few cards in your hand, and you also get to gain three life. And this again is great. You can just sit, it's an enchantment. So it just sits there once you've cast it, and then you can choose when you want to spend one white, uh, discard a card and gain three life but of course you've got to be able to choose and discard a card for this one as opposed to the other card where it was just you know discard uh, discard your hand and um you know that could be an empty hand and it still counts as a discard so it's a slightly different thing where well, you're choosing and discarding a card So with that, yeah, counter spells. Um, sorry, what am I saying? So I'm just looking at my notes here to make sure there's nothing else in here. Yeah, discard cards to gain life, which can be useful for staying in the game longer. Got four dark rituals. Single black, add three black to mana pool pretty straightforward so that's your um yeah mana acceleration very handy card in any black deck three disenchants so we're main boarding a an ability here to 
destroy a target artifact or an enchantment. Uh, not only can you use that to target your opponent's stuff, but uh, it might be a good way if you, you know, wanted something out of the, uh, you know, out of play for a while for whatever reason. You could you could blow up your own enchantments, and um, and artifacts. Although most of the enchantments, you can see a large majority of these. You know, there's a choice as to whether you want to activate the spell on it. So yeah, but but it's there, and uh, like I said, you can use it to deal with obviously opponents' stuff. But if if there was any reason, you could uh, you could blow up your own stuff. 17 land, 4 reflecting pools. This is an interesting card, so tap it, add to your mana pool 1 mana of any type that any land you control can produce. Because there's also 4 salt flats in the deck, which at the time were these interesting tap lands. So they're, um, you know, if you want to tap them for either white or black, which you're going to need in this deck to uh, activate the color spells here okay um yeah it, it's they come into play tapped you can choose to tap them for colorless mana but if you want access to the colored mana then they do one damage but what's interesting is if there's one of these in play and it's still tapped it's still you can still that still counts is one man of any type that any land you control can produce, like has the potential to produce. So if you've got a tapped salt flats in play and you have a reflecting pool, you can still, you can leverage the, the, the colours. But then the rest of the land is all colours anyway. So, yeah. Ours is mine. So these are interesting cards. These are the ones where, you know, you, they generate one colourless mana. But if you control... The other cards, Urza's is mine. So if you've got all everything, Urza's is mine, Urza's is power plant, Urza's is tower, you get to do two colorless instead of one. Urza power plant again, two colorless instead of one, and then Urza's tower does three instead of one. So a massive amount of colorless mana potentially if you've got all three of these in play, which is great for you know, the artifacts and anything else that needs colourless mana. And then four Wrath of Gods to just get rid of all the creatures, which doesn't matter to you because you have no creatures in the deck. So yeah, just going through again. Early game, focus on setting up your mana base with the Dark Rituals, Lotus Petals and the lands. And then you want to get M Magrim and Bottomless Pit out fairly early to start off that discard engine and then Magrim's pinging them, pinging your opponents. So while you are discarding, because uh, everybody has to discard uh, during each player's upkeep, Magrim is not dealing you two damage because it's only opponents that it does that to. And then mid-game, Wrath of God in Staring Bridge, controlling the board you got Scroll Rack as well. As soon as you've got enough mana to start using that, you can start filtering, um, you know, your your hand and exchanging your hand with your library. And then late game, just carrying on with controlling the board with the discard effects and artifacts and anything else that helps you sort of... Um, helps you counter various spells... Um, but still, you know, McGrim and your bottomless pits are whittling down your life, the life total. But also, you've got um, Curse Scroll as well um, under the appropriate circumstances, um, which can consistently deal to damage if you know your opponent has to choose a card for your right random from your hand, you only have one card, you're gonna name the card that you've got in your hand, so guaranteed two damage. So that's gonna speed things up a bit. But it is a three and a tap, so you can't just 
sync manner into it and there's no way in here of untapping so let's just look at some of the key cards in terms of the the engine and the filtering I think that's what I'm going to focus on in this episode so here's an old brooch it's only ever printed in Exodus so first of all it's interesting because I was half expecting it to explain this where well, there might be possible confusion so if your hand is zero it still counts you can you know you're, you're not just you're discarding your hand um because you're discarding this you know, hand zone but you can do it as it counts as a discard even if there's nothing there apparently and i checked online and there were several websites from around this time that said yes you know every website i read is that yep doesn't matter if your hand's empty it's still a discard so pay two tap it discard your hand your hand zero yep fine and then you do this so but it's funny there's no mention of it down here i think it would have come up enough to come into the rules information so i'm going to go into the scryfall tagger because it, it is interesting this whole idea of reusable counter spells so in magic there are 43 reusable counter spells now you can probably see here um you know reusable in what way well they could be a reusable ability on a permanent or there could be something in the spell that makes it reusable like buyback on here you know so you've got enchantments and of course, the other thing is there may be other ways that the counter is triggered or slightly more convoluted methods. Or might be specific to certain colours of magic. So yeah, interesting um, you know combinations of alternative um, costing additional things you have to do certain restrictions those sort of things or well, maybe there's just a straight cost Yeah, and notice here it's a bit different. So when you've got discard a card, so notice discard a card is different from discard your hand. So in the case of discard a card, you have to have a card to discard. Okay, let's look at um, Cube Cobra. Just see what these are often drafted with. So you have Null Brooch and Curse Scroll. Things like Grave Digger. So let me just go back a step so we know what we're doing here. So yeah, we're discarding, and so you know, stuff that um, interacts with yeah, where those things are naming or has other um, abilities that care about our hand. So, for example, if we're actually using null spell to discard our whole hand and then next turn we draw a card so we just got one card in our hand we're going to know which card to name for our curse scroll and we got things like corpse dance all that sort of stuff so synergistic side of things yeah lots of um sack effects here on that side of things So we've got McGrim, which is uh, works with our bottomless pit. Opponent discard matters. You know, twenty of those, which specifically talk about opponents discarding cards. 
stuff you might want to play around with. In terms of the cube synergies and draft it's with, again we're talking about discarding stuff so no surprise to see Hypnotic Spectre here, um, you know, obviously Dark Ritual, it's a black card so you know, Accelerant's good in terms of getting it out. Then we've got things like him to Turak, Duress, another Spectre, so yeah, you know, sort of thing that um, definitely is interesting. McGrim's interesting in, in you know, like an Ohan No Land deck. Synergistically, again, we've got cards here that synergize with the fact you're playing black. Yeah, so Liniana's Caress, so you know, whenever an opponent discards a card, that player loses two life. So it you know doubles up there, so yeah. Got things like Silent Spectre. Yep, Wrench Mines, so another another of these sort of discard cards. Okay, bottomless pit. So the other part of this, so yeah, discard outlet. Of which there are quite a number. Some of these might be tied up with, you know, the loot or the rob the um rummaging effects on certain cards. And also you know, symmetrical effects, of which there are six hundred in magic, and they could be all manner of things that's happening across the board. Drafting and synergistically in cubes, well again. Things like Hypnotic Spectre. Also, because you know this is doing it across the board, or where you know everybody's um, discarding a card. You know, often decks where something else is happening across the board as well, or. A spells where there's you know a, a downside to you i mean in this deck you discarding is advantageous but there's a number of um mono black decks where you're using resources as a fuel for something extra so like carnophage you're using what life um pay one life or tap carnophage during your upkeep because you know it's a two two for one so yeah and a few other ones that interact with the graveyard because obviously, you know, why not get your stuff back if you put it in there? And, you know, other cards that are actually in this deck like Curse Scroll or other cards that um, have like discard effects on them like Necropotence. Obviously, with these as well, um, you know, you've you've got some interactions with filtering effects. So, you get to, through the filter effects where you're filtering between your library and your hand. You get to sort of choose to some degree what you might want to discard. So maybe there's a card there you don't want to discard, and you might want to swap it out with another one. So yeah, cut a scroll. Mini game. It's a pinger. So other pingers. One and two damage repeatedly. 268 in magic. And I'm sure anybody that plays red will be aware of a few of these. 
Uh, yeah, this curse scroll with slightly different artwork. Got some old school cards here as well. Dwarven Sea Clan. Cool. That's nice artwork. G Electrode. Okay. Having a look on Cube Cobra. Well, yeah. <laughs> Often drafted with burn spells. <laughs> Another sort of, uh, you know, red deck wins type things. In terms of synergy side of things, then we're getting over to things like, you know, the rack. And... Where is it? Yeah, that's a pinger, isn't it, of sorts. Necropotence again. Yeah. Oh yeah, there's army ants. Remember that one? Sacrifice the land, destroy target land. Yeah. Ravenous Rats. Okay, now we get to Ensnaring Bridge. So this is an interesting card. So, yeah, Prison Effect. There's 26 of those that fall into that category. Yes, can be incredibly frustrating to play against. <laughs> so yeah, other cards, 153 cards that prevent attack. And you've got things like Arrest, obviously, so we're going to have a mixed bag in here. Yeah, there's quite a number of white cards that fall into that category, actually. Let's see, yeah, lock, lock down creatures in some way. And then the whole hand size matters thing. So 273 cards. So, you know, if you are interested in exploring that space beyond just not having no hand, but some cards that uh, look at, you know, the hand side either end of the spectrum. So either not having or having few cards in your hand or having a lot and scaling accordingly. And yeah, it's um interesting thing to look at beyond the, just the whole you know, no hand, no land thing is, you know, other cards which actually reward for um, having large amounts of hands or or punish the opponent for having a large amount of hand or, you know, and stuff that can be used interact, um, synergistically with, you know, party type cards which cause a lot of hand draw. So the other end of the equation, if you like, or the other end of the scale. So, yeah. And ensnaring breed in terms of often drafted with you can see we've got a few you know mana rocks here um was that the highest it wasn't was it that was three and it was the was the null brooch was four wasn't it so yeah so but yeah obviously mana matters as you get up to the higher artifact cards but then there's tutors for this because ensnaring bridge if you remember is an artifact now Enlightened Tutor, yeah, is artifacts or enchantment cards. So that's why stuff like that is there. But remember as well, um, Phyrexian Metamorph copies any artifact or creature. Yeah, that's this is why I love this card so much. <laughs> it's just yeah. Phyrexian, another one of my favourites. So add it to the list of cards that are my favourites and I kind of remember. So Phyrexian Metamorph, Phyrexian Rebirth. Well I've remembered that. And um 
Oh, God, yeah, the one I've forgotten is a legendary that um, copies other abilities across the board on creatures. This is another one of my favourites um, in magic. Oh, and of course Eldrazi Monument, I think, you know, fits in there as well. Where are we? Synergistic cards. So what have we got? Yeah, so no surprise here to see things like Voltaic Key coming up. When you're talking about like artifact stuff, this ability to untap a target artifact. Now with Ensnaring Bridge, interestingly enough, it doesn't tap, but um, this must be sort of generally. And there is a, I think I said before, you know, there's some stuff in here where you think, oh, wouldn't it be nice if you could actually untap that and redo redo the ability on certain cards in the deck? So yeah. Things like what? Kundra's Bauble to get back from the graveyard. Yeah. Oh, yeah, Metal Worker. Wow, some nice ones here. Mystical. Oh, there's Braids again. Spell Skite. Oh, some classics. Yeah, Shield Sphere. This is interesting. So, zero to cast. It's a zero six, but it counts as a wall. Shield Sphere is assigned as a blocker, put a, a zero minus one counter on it. Okay, so hopefully you enjoyed this sort of inaugural episode of um, this old deck. Let me know um, if there's any favourite <laughs> decks. Uh, 98 or before that you would like me to cover. I don't know how many people are familiar with that period in Magic. Um, but that's where I am at the moment in terms of that, that space. And uh, I'm looking forward to going through some of the both serious tournament decks and the casual decks in these two books. So thanks once again for watching. Bye for now. And I will catch you in a future episode.